NET presents USA Poetry. This program is devoted to the work of Frank O'Hara and Ed Sanders. Uh, Mozart's Chemisier is a, is a poem I wrote after visiting David Smith, the great American sculptor in his house at Bolton Landing, and it's really cool. The Mozart comes in because he was his favorite composer. For instance, you walk in and faint. You are being one with Africa. I saw the soda standing next to the bay stallion. It was still foaming. It had what is called a head on it. Then I went and had a double carbonated bourbon on the porch. In the moonlight, the poplars looked like aspidistra. Over the unexperienced lake, wait, wait a while, it all kept murmuring. But I know that always makes me sad. There was a lot of tinselly sky out, which irritated me too. And my anger is strictly European plan. Now why would I get up and dance around? You see, it is all very beautiful, the emphasis being on suds, suds in the lake, suds in my heart. Luckily, when the lake, the tree, was tempting me, I didn't have any white Toreador pants back at the ranch. They were serving bubbly gin, so I ran down the trail, so short a trail, so sweet a smell, hay in your ears, it's hot. Oh, world, why are you so easy to figure out? Beneath the ground, there is something beautiful. I've had enough of sky, it's so obvious. Everyone thinks they're going up in these here America. Put on your earrings, we're going to the railway station. I don't care how small the house they live in is. You don't have any earrings, I don't have a ticket. On July 25, 1966, a few weeks after this film was completed, Frank O'Hara died from injuries sustained in an automobile accident. Frank O'Hara was an associate curator of painting and sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art. He was a playwright as well as an art critic and was one of the wittiest of contemporary poets. He was part of the group, including John Ashbery and Kenneth Koch, sometimes called the New York Poets. John and Kenneth and I, and a number of other people later, found that the only people who were interested in our poetry were painters or sculptors. That the, you know, they were enthusiastic about the different ideas and they were more inquisitive. Uh, they had no, being non-literary, they had no uh, party tree about academic standards, attitudes, and so on. Um, so that you could say, I don't like Yeats. And they would say, I know just how you feel, I hate Picasso, too. <laughs> that sort of thing. It's a much pleasanter atmosphere than the literary community was providing at the time. And apart from the fact, of course, that the only people who were doing anything interesting were painters. One painter very much interested in contemporary poetry is Alfred Leslie, who happens to be a filmmaker as well as a painter. In his New York studio, he shows Frank O'Hara some of his current work the best known of which is probably this larger-than-life-size self-portrait. Leslie is one of the painters who collaborated with the New York poets in various theatrical productions. O'Hara and he are currently collaborating on a film. Poets in, in New York always sort of had some kind of a relationship with theater. When the artist theater was started, for instance, the whole point of it was to do plays of an avant-garde content but have real artists do the sets, rather than commercial designers. The painters who collaborated with us, like Alfred and Larry Rivers and Grace Hartigan and Jane Frolicker, uh, and Elaine de Kooning, um, and Nell Blaine, um, they got the script and saw it as a theatrical event. It was not going to be made into something where you take it to Boston and adjust it and rewrite it and it's really the, just the raw material for an experience. The painters that we worked with read the script, either liked it or didn't like it, or wanted to do it or didn't want to do it, but they saw it as a theatrical event already, which very few people in the theater will do anymore. You see here, you don't have a view down. So in order to paint these and have the whole sense of confrontation and frontality, actually there are four, uh, positions of perspective. Mm. If these are bigger, by the way, than life size. If, look at the perspective you get. When you come up, it's almost tantamount. The reason that I'm interested in movies is not as a substitute for poetry, but who's making it. You know, if Al is making it, then I'm interested in the sense that I can understand what it's going to be, or that I know it's at least going to be something interesting for me. 
One of the poems in Frank O'Hara's book, Meditations in an Emergency, published in 1957 by Grove Press, is titled, To the Film Industry in Crisis. And in part, the film script that O'Hara is writing with Alfred Leslie is derived from this poem. The main point is that, that it's nobody's business what anybody does when they're alone. All right, should we just and say And these people are being intruded upon, and then when the, if somebody else finds out what they're doing, that some way or another they're criticized, they're condemned, that, yeah. uh, and it, it's <laughs> nobody's business. But we time this now up to here. Three minutes, We yeah. have three minutes and 40 seconds. Now, in three minutes, the, at the beginning of the film, Dorothea starts making love to Miles. And John is laying there, and he's sort of talking about the church, and he sort of, uh, oh, yeah, then at one point, just about that time, uh, Johnny Hearn says, um, oh, wait a minute, uh, let me, let me, uh, let me sort of engage myself a little bit with Dorothea. And then he pulls Dorothea away yeah. from Miles. And then Miles gets rather cross. That's just about the time this is happening. And actually, for the rest of the film, Dorothea and John are making love, and Miles is addressing himself to Dorothea. How old was I when I realized I wouldn't enjoy anything anymore? Anxiety is just another form of entertainment. Negroes are religious. I am religious. Therefore, I am a Negro. At least I am now white. We walked on and on, hating each other. They're on 14th Street. Yeah. The air was better in bed. Now my eyes hurt. I'm coughing and out of cigarettes. I looked at them on the corner of 23rd Street and 7th Avenue. I wanted to lie down and be run over. It will come anyway. We looked at the Chelsea Hotel. It seemed to be damaged like everything else. Two nuns walked by looking like lady wrestlers. I thought of my childhood and my dirty underwear, my socks. Pollution isn't interesting. You can't even see it. I'm a sight queen, I guess. If you can't see it, it isn't there until it hits you. Boom. I wonder where the land of the orange trees really is. Not Southern California, maybe Nome. Maybe Pittsburgh, maybe Nagasaki, maybe Nome. I'm going down there in the sweet polluted twilight if the sun ever goes down and if they ever go away from my quiet walk along 14th Street and 7th Avenue and 23rd Street. Who are they anyway? It's raining. It makes me feel sweaty like last night. I hate to feel sweaty. She doesn't feel anything about me or him. She just wants to be accommodating. We're all generalized, like mannequins. It's nobody's business what people do when they're alone. Everybody is always intruding, but it never makes any difference anyway. Yeah, terrific. Oh, all it's right. going to be marvelous. It's going to be terrific. Okay. Yeah. But I kept seeing the image, and it was very, very exciting. But then I went ahead, like, um, you know, because John does uh, have these ambivalent feelings, I think so. She, she thinks she's some sort of cornball... Salome. Don't get to attack the viewer. I think she'd like to have my head. Oops. Hello? Jim. How are you? You have an upset stomach. What did you do? You went to the uh, Kansas City, I suppose. This is a very peculiar situation because while I'm talking to you, I'm typing and also being filmed for educational TV. Can you imagine that? <laughs> yeah. Alfred Leslie is holding my hand. <laughs> while it's happening. It's known as performance. <laughs> what? Yeah, all right. Flash and bolt. What does that mean? Flashing bolt, you mean? Right in. <laughs> oh, good. Flashing bolt. Okay. A flashing bolt. Is that art, or what is it? I just laid it onto the paper. Frank O'Hara's most recent book is titled Love Poems, published by Tibor Nanage Editions, New York. In 1959, O'Hara wrote this about his poetry. What is happening to me, allowing for lies and exaggerations which I try to avoid, goes into my poems. I don't think my experiences are clarified or made beautiful for myself or anyone else. They are just there in whatever form I can find them. This is called Fantasy Dedicated to the Health of Allen Ginsberg. It depends on how angry you get as you go along and how dissatisfied. 
How do you like the music of Adolf Deutsch? I like it. I like it better than Max Steiner's. Take his score for Northern Pursuit, the Helmut Dantin theme was. And then the window fell on my hand. Errol Flynn was skiing by. Down, down, down went the grim gray submarine under the cold ice. Helmut was safely ashore on the ice. What dreams, what incredible fantasies of snow farts will this all lead to? I don't know. I have stopped thinking like a sled dog. The main thing is to tell a story. It is almost very important. Imagine, throwing away the avalanche so early in the movie. I am the only spy left in Canada. But just because I'm alone in the snow doesn't necessarily mean I'm a Nazi. Let's see. Two aspirins, a vitamin C tablet, and some baking soda should do the trick. That's practically an Alka-Seltzer. Alan, come out of the bathroom and take it. I think someone put butter on my skis instead of wax. Ouch. The lean-to is falling over in the furs, and there is another fatter spy there. They didn't tell me they sent him. Well, that takes care of him. Boy, were those huskies hungry. Alan, are you feeling any better? Yes, I'm crazy about Helmut Dantin. But I'm glad that Canada will remain free. Just free, that's all. Never argue with the movies. The Day Lady Died. It is 12.20 in New York, a Friday. Three days after Bastille Day, yes. It is 19.59 and I go get a shoe shine because I will get off the 4.19 in East Hampton at 7.15 and then go straight to dinner and I don't know the people who will feed me. I walk up the muggy street beginning to sun and have a hamburger and a malted and buy an ugly New World writing to see what the poets in Ghana are doing these days. I go on to the bank, and Miss Stillwagon, first name Linda, I once heard, doesn't even look up my balance for once in her life. And in the Golden Griffin, I get a little Verlaine <clears throat> for Patsy, with drawings by Bonar, although I do think of Hesiod, Trans Richard, Richmond Lattimore, or Brendan Bean's new play, or Le Balcon, or Les Dag, or Genet. But I don't. I stick with Verlaine, after practically going to sleep with quandariness. And for Mike, I just stroll into the Park Lane liquor store and ask for a bottle of Strega, and then I go back where I came from, to 6th Avenue, and the tobacconist in the Ziegfeld Theater, and casually ask for a carton of Goulois <clears throat> and a carton of Picayunes and a New York Post with her face on it. And I am sweating a lot by now and thinking of leaning on the John door in the five spot while she whispered a song along the keyboard to Mal Waldron and everyone and I stopped breathing. The next poem is called Song. Is it dirty? Does it look dirty? That's what you think of in the city. Does it just seem dirty? That's what you think of in the city. You don't refuse to breathe, do you? Someone comes along with a very bad character. He seems attractive. Is he really? Yes, very. He's attractive as his character is bad, is it? Yes. That's what you think of in the city. Run your finger along your no moss mind. That's not a thought, that's soot. And you take a lot of dirt off someone. Is the character less bad? No. It improves constantly. You don't refuse to breathe, do you? This poem is from the love poems. And, um... It's sort of like uh, I had the idea of uh, Marianne Moore in a way because the title is part of the poem and also as it, it defines something, but I don't know how. The poem is called Having a Coke with You. It's even more fun than going to St. Sebastian, Irun, Ondai, Biarritz, Bayonne, or being sick to my stomach on the Travesera de Gracia in Barcelona. Partly because in your orange shirt you look like a better, happier St. Sebastian. Partly because of my love for you, partly because of your love for yogurt, partly because of the fluorescent orange tulips around the birches, partly because of the secrecy our smiles take on before people in statuary. It is hard to believe when I'm with you that there can be anything as still, as solemn, as unpleasantly definitive as statuary when right in front of it, in the warm New York four o'clock light. We are drifting back and forth between each other like a tree breathing through its spectacles. And the portrait show seems to have no faces in it at all, just paint. 
you suddenly wonder why in the world anyone ever did them. I look at you, and I would rather look at you than all the portraits in the world, except possibly for the Polish rider occasionally, and anyway it's in the frick, which, thank heavens, you haven't gone to yet, so we can go together the first time. And the fact that you move so beautifully, more or less, takes care of futurism, just as at home I never think of the nude descending a staircase or, at a rehearsal, a single drawing of Leonardo or Michelangelo that used to wow me. And what good does all the research of the Impressionists do them when they never got the right person to stand near the tree when the sun sank? Or for that matter, Marino Marini, when he didn't pick the rider as carefully as the horse. It seems they were all cheated of some marvelous experience, which is not going to go wasted on me, which is why I'm telling you about it. Well, I'm going to uh, get a cream-gilded yacht, and I'm going to communicate with my neophytes through ship-to-shore phone. No, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I probably, I, I will sell out. No, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I, I hope I don't. No, see, the, the temptation of money, you know, people keep running up to our group, and they say, well, if you change your name, or if you'll just take those three words out, buddy, we'll get you on all the, all the, all the uh, disc jockeys. And we'll play your records. Well, I, I, it's difficult. It's a difficult posture to be in, to be uh, bribed, as it were. Bribed, I mean, as it is, bribe, bribery. No, I'm not going to sell out. Well, I'm going to. Uh, we're, uh, we're embarking on. A, I'm now embarking on a new series of magazines uh, in spite of the police harassment. It is difficult to describe the work of Ed Sanders in traditional literary terms. Much of his poetry raises questions of legality that are increasingly being defined in the courts today. In brief. He is a young man, born in Kansas, and now in his mid-twenties, who has developed an aptitude for scandal. He owns the Peace Eye Bookstore on East 10th Street in New York City, and he is the leader of a rock and roll group known as the Fugs. Well, I see I'm enmeshed in this Lower East Side culture, which is composed of uh, artists, writers, the usual, but many, many poets who are operating, like Allen Ginsberg, who lives a block away, and uh, Frank O'Hara, which lives, lives three, three, four blocks that way. In between uh, those two, we have like thousands of poets and dope fiends and uh, writers and uh, entrepreneurs and amphetamine heads and coke freaks. And, uh, a very interesting place. Uh, the buildings were condemned about 50 years ago and uh, certainly is a, uh, a negative police situation here, similar to other areas, other bohemian areas in the country. But uh, it's a wonderful place to live in. Uh, the mafia king who controls all the jukeboxes in the world lives a block away. Well, I formed this bookstore as sort of a uh, freak center and scrounge lounge. And uh, during the evening, sure enough, it fills up with uh, creeps and poets and thinkers and writers and artists, musicians. And uh, it's sort of a focal scene for this 10 block area for, in terms of like uh, where little magazines can be distributed. I have, you know, like, the major avant-garde magazines come in here and get sold or get stolen. Mostly get stolen. This is from my nationwide bestseller book. <laughs> this is a poem, um, a fairly long poem, so I read, would read only the first section. Uh, it's a, uh, it's to my mother who's buried in a lonely Missouri cemetery. It's called Cemetery Hill. Uh, the night she died, I had uh, extraordinary religious experiences uh, of a solar nature. That is, of a of a uh, boat or a uh, barge, a coffin-bearing barge, uh, uniting with the sun in the dawn. I was very upset, and I uh, had temporary uh, uh, religious visual experiences. Cemetery Hill, the scene, March 10, 1957, Cemetery Hill, at the foot of which we lived, 11 p.m. death of mother, mother appears in my room, calls name, touches, then floats out to death barge, late night vision of the death barge floating through the sky and entering the dawn sun disk. 
And the hands with white veins there dropped on me from above and boiling, 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 the breath of fire came boiling and the white eyes floated out upon the darkness in my room and the voice called out from there, my name, 11 p.m., March 10, 1957, silence. And floating up over the hill beyond the cemetery was apparition with veins full of white blood and white eyes beaming berserkness, nameless, a phantom, never to enter again the house she cursed and to have grown thin in the curse house down from the cemetery hill where I knew death would enter early after my grandmother had misinformed me about death. You shall never die and my mother hipping me later about death, and I ran out into the cemetery, out onto the terrace, and faced the cemetery up on the hill where the winter's sunrise glistened off the metal nameplates there. Death rays focused into young eye. Yes, I ran out onto terrace in a death vulsion, for grandmother had said the doctors would make me live forever, and I cried there, stomped into the death chain which I had fled, age five fled, fled and always the sun shafts glistening off of tombstones on the hill above my home meant death. Death was a hill with tombstones for teeth, a grandmother, a mother without hope, and in the mornings a rain crow exuding death in the trees. And day now puking itself up over the horizon reflects on Cemetery Hill, beams upon the ground where my mother lies in a beige suit in a dark brown coffin, ears laden with earrings and a necklace on the neck. And on the night she died, I saw the barge of death float out into the black and the death ship full of cakes and vases entered the plexus, freaked itself in the sun's eye. And I heard her voice at 11 p.m., silence, March 10, 1957. And she floated up over the hill beyond the cemetery and entered the sun barge. And when dawn was bawling the hill, she was sucked into the sun. Oh, I have seen, seen, seen her floating on the barge. And she was as a sunflower invaded by floodlights. And her eyes were white and her veins were full of white blood. And her mind opened out and the brain valves were turned open. And she entered the brilliance and her mind was staggered in the flood of phenomena. And I have heard, oh, I have heard my mother on the barge of death seduced into the rainbow, led into the current, a telephone book smeared with blood, and I have heard my mother as her shades stomped out of the steaming flesh and her voice claws out of the night there, whose hands were so beautiful, whose hands hooked out at the oxygen tin as she lay dying, puked into the death rattle, bones a-rattle, cuck a cuck stomp out of the blossom, frenzy of the time murin, death meat cooling off, sunflower out of the flesh, all out, all out. That's, that's that. Ed Sanders is the publisher of a magazine which cannot be sent through the mails. And although his fame is largely underground, he is regarded by a number of important American poets, including Charles Olson, as the most exciting poet of the younger generation. Among his many activities, he is also an active pacifist and was one of those arrested in the early 1960s for boarding a nuclear submarine in New London Harbor. We spent all summer uh, training, training ourselves, uh, getting in shape for uh, Operation Frogman, which was a, uh, we would approach these submarines in boats at uh, advertised times, that is whenever, say, Jacqueline Kennedy or somebody was there to christen a submarine. We would go up there and try to swim and get on a submarine and wave a flag around. And uh, it was kind of a paranoid game because if you didn't, uh, if you didn't touch the submarine or if you didn't get on the submarine, you didn't get much of a punishment. It was a great pacifist goal to actually get on a submarine. But if you did get on a submarine, man, you got like a year in prison. So like you had to, the peace movement wanted you to get on the submarine for, for publicity and for, uh, for some in, internal spiritual mysticism of like getting on the great matriarchal submarine. But at the same time, boy, you knew if you got on that submarine, one year in the slam, one year at Danbury prison. So uh, that was a great... Uh, anyway, we did it all summer, and we'd, uh, we'd go out to this little pond in uh, Connecticut, and we'd train and swim and... We'd choose up sides. Half of us would be frogmen, and the other half would be pacifists, and we'd try to elude the frogmen and stuff. So the big day came, and uh, we swam out. And um, the poem from jail. <laughs> the 
situation in the peace movement is very vague. You see, I think uh, from a, uh, like I'm getting, I'm, I'm aging. I'm 26 now. You know. When I was boarding submarines, I was only 21. You know, it's, it, I feel now that as I start zooming toward middle age, that I'll have to get into a field where I can uh, do long, have long-term projects. And I feel this singing group I'm with, we could, we have like our, we have a, a song called "Kill for Peace," which is like a blatant, bold statement about the situation in Vietnam. But we feel we can present that to teenagers of America in a way that many peace demonstrations couldn't, because we can get it on the jukeboxes and, and hopefully over the airwaves. And on another field, we want to present literary rock and roll. For instance, we have a song called the I Saw the Best Minds My Generation Rock, which is uh, Allen Ginsberg's uh, very wonderful poem edited to a highly precise rock genre. And we have uh, our first 45 release has on the flip side a poem by Charles Olson from Maximus from Dogtown. Drink, or break open our veins, so need to know, so need to know, so need to know. Hunger drives me onward to feel all of the skin. pacifists and uh, things like that. We have, all, have all, these, uh, we have these messages and missions. Ed Sanders can be described as a long-haired put-on and as a genuine street poet. His name is always one of the first mentioned in any discussion of American poets under 30. Ironically, his best-known work is precisely that which cannot be presented on television. Unlike the generation of Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, and William Carlos Williams, the poets of Sanders' generation, now in their 20s, seem to be heading up a revolution not of style, but of content. It is the subject matter, not the arrangement of the lines or of the words on the page that creates the scandal. A recent Time magazine article commented on Sanders' rock and roll group as follows. When it comes to sheer shock value, no one can match the fugs. They have no use for innuendo. They lay it right on the line. The article comments further that the fugs' scatological satires have gained a steadily growing audience on the college campuses. And Sanders himself is quoted as saying, there are too many taboos in society and we want to eliminate them. Being a fug is better than being on a peace walk. Right now involved in a censorship case for various uh, unmentionable publications of my own, uh, and the fugs uh, conceivably could very easily get into uh, a legal situation with some of their material. So we'll have to, we have to remain, we have to remain uh, in unison with ourselves, so we can't sell out. You know, we have to like we have to sing our songs, we have to write our poetry. If we don't do, if you know, if we if we don't if we don't just proceed forward uh, and talk and speak and think and act the way we want to, then uh, then our our children will scorn us. <laughs> <laughs> 